And a matter of fact, uh, this gone week or last week, uh, he celebrated his 41st wedding anniversary. And <clears throat> after shortly after school, uh, Mr. Flimmer and his wife went to Japan where they taught English. Then they got a call to go to Africa to minister where he met me in Liberia. And he was very young at a time. He had a long, long hair. And now it's going away. And because of that, we, we, uh, we just bonded together. As small as I was, if, you, if you're looking for me, you find me at his place. I'm so pleased um, to, to, to have him here with us. He stayed four years at Konola. It's the Seventh-day Adventist school mission. After that, he left and came back to the States where he worked with Adra for 30 years. Today, Mr. Flemmer is the executive director for Greater Washington Service near Washington and uh, the school there. I pray that as we listen to him today, that God will speak to him and we will be the hearer. May God bless us all. Good morning, everyone. I take it this will fit up here somehow. There we go. Can you hear me? I tend to have a big voice, so that's usually not too much of a trouble. Yeah, Luzon was one of the four musketeers at Connell Academy. There was, Luzon was Liberian, then there was Kofi, he was Ghanaian, then there was an American boy named David, and then there was a Norwegian missionary there that had adopted a Korean boy. Those four were playing all the time, making all kinds of trouble. This is Compassion Sabbath. And it's something that's interesting. The church announced that the second Sabbath of every month would be Compassion Sabbath. And most people have never heard about it. And yet when you tell them about it, they go, wow, that's a great idea. The idea is to get us out of our churches and to get us engaged with the community. And the church has found a lot of opportunity lately to get engaged with the community, especially in Europe where our church is a bit weaker than in a lot of places. Uh, Europe has become extremely secular and our Adventist churches in some countries are actually shrinking until immigrants show up and then they expand again. So you'll find in some countries, there's more Ghanaian Adventists on Sabbath morning than there are Dutch Adventists or Swedish Adventists or, or some of these countries. So it's given the church a lot of opportunity. And in Europe right now, what do we have going on? Syrian refugees, Iraqi refugees, and it's in the news all over the place. But some of our churches and some of our congregations are doing some rather interesting things. Uh, in one of our churches in Sweden, um, they brought, I don't know how many, but a good number of Syrians. And the church organized itself. And they says, well, you know, in Sweden, we love to ski. Let's teach these new arrivals about skiing so that they'll have a better understanding of how Swedish society works. They helped them all get bicycles. They started a soccer league. They created in the Avenist church like a little cafe where they could come and meet and, and, and have a place to hang out. And eventually it came out that the main person working on this was a Christian pastor, the Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And it left them stunned that the Christians would be so involved in helping them. I don't know how many of you get the Adventist World Review, the one that just came recently, was, was the whole issue was about refugees. Um, there, there was, there's another, and I know her quite well. And by the way, the church has designated next Sabbath as refugee Sabbath because it's 
the UN has announced, what is it, the 20th or something as World Refugee Day. So the Adventist Church in this. But one of the articles in this was about, um, it was entitled In the Trenches. And Slovenia, which is the upper part of what used to be Yugoslavia, for those of us that are a bit older, there's a little country there, Slovenia, maybe two million people. The Adventist Church is about 500 strong. And there's an adra there by the sheer will of a young lady named Maya. And she has mobilized. Everybody in that country has heard of Adra, even though it's just a small Adventist church behind it, because she is out in the shopping malls doing fairs and fundraisers. So when the refugee thing came, volunteers just started showing up when they heard. And, and Adra in Slovenia was one of the main organizations, humanitarian organizations, helping them as they move, you know, they would come with maybe just a little tiny bag with a few little things in it. And uh, she reports that the biggest headache she's had is shoes. People will donate a lot of things, but shoes are so often the big need. Um, even here in this country, uh, shoes for people that are really struggling is a very difficult thing. Um, I run the Avenus Community Service Center and this afternoon I'll do a little seminar, but it was three churches there in the Tacoma Park area around the old General Conference building that got together in the late 70s and says, instead of each of us doing a little something, let's come together and create a, a center. So they built a building and uh, it has been there ever since, since 1983. Um, unfortunately, in those 30 years, no one had done any maintenance on that building. It was not only the Adventist eyesore, it was the community eyesore. It was a dreadful building. But God is good. He gave me two plumbing malfunctions and it's like, God, what are you doing? We're working so hard here. With the insurance money and donated carpet out of the general conference building, I completely renovated the inside. And there's a group like Habitat for Humanity called Rebuilding Together. Habitat for Humanity only works for individual houses. Rebuilding Together says, no, nonprofits also need help. They completely renovated the outside of my building. And brought in volunteers. It was the employees of Fannie Mae that raised the money for it. And they sent over a big group of volunteers one day to help make some of that happen. They planted plants in the yard and they painted the whole thing and, and uh, I ended up with a new roof, so I have a new building, and it feels so good. Because even poor people have a sense of dignity. And you look at this tumble-down old building, and you say, well, the services in there can't possibly be good. They don't even respect their own building. Now that it's all renovated, I feel so good. And the clients feel good. Because... But coming back to my shoes, I'm wandering all over the place, sorry. Coming back to the shoes. He blogged about it, but in Bellsville, which is kind of a suburb of Washington, D.C. My wife taught in their school and we attended there for many years. The pastor is quite an innovative guy and he did a series in the fall called Seven Days Without. He went seven days without shelter. He actually went into Washington, D.C. and lived on the street like a homeless person. And what he learned, he blogged about what he was learning about how to cope. You know, where could you get this and where could you get that? And the whole network that the homeless create to help themselves. Then he did seven days without shoes. He went barefoot for seven days to draw attention to the huge numbers of people in the world who don't have shoes. And unfortunately, it was a rainy, cold week. So he really drove the message home. And at the end of that week, they did communion and had a shoe drive. I got a call saying, you know, we're going to do a shoe drive. We don't know how many shoes we're going to get. It could be a lot. It could be just a few. But would you take them? Well, you never say no. 
don't know where you're going to put them, but so I said, sure. About two weeks after the food, shoe drive, he says, I'm ready to deliver them. I'm going to come over this afternoon. He comes over with one of these 16 passenger vans that a lot of pathfinders use. That thing was stuffed with shoes to the windshield. There was just a spot for him. I estimate there must have been seven or 800 pairs of shoes. I didn't have any place to put them, but we stuffed them into cracks and corners. And at Christmas time at our center, we do a big food distribution with a turkey. About in Thanksgiving, we do about 800 families, and at Christmas, it's about 600 families. And we had just finished putting carpet and painting my office, which was right up front. And we decided that before I moved my furniture in there, we'd just set up these tables at the food distribution for Christmas, and we'd put out these shoes men's shoes on one side, women's shoes on the other side. And one of our clients had told me when I mentioned, he says, oh, that's wonderful. Shoes are so hard because you're barely making ends meet. And now you've got to spend $40, $50 on a pair of shoes. That's tough to pull that money together. I saw a young lady who was there to collect her food basket. And she walked down the rows of shoes. There were children's shoes. And I saw her pick out a nice pair of high heels. And I thought to myself, go girl. <laughs> You're going to feel really special over these holidays. It was a chance for her to do something for herself that didn't negatively impact anybody else in the family. And I thought, wow, that just, I, that just made me smile. It just made my day to see that woman uh, so happy to pick out a pair of shoes for herself. Anyway, with the refugees, and I'll talk about it this afternoon, about the importance of networking. Um, Tacoma Park, and Tacoma Park is where the old General Conference is, building was. Tacoma Park is what it is because of Adventists. You go down some of those streets, I'm sure 90% of the houses were built by Seventh-day Adventists. And today, there's no Adventists left in Tacoma Park. One or two here or there. And the city goes, why did you abandon us? And I have a phrase. I call it Saturday morning tourists. You drive in Saturday morning. You listen to a good lecture. You have a good discussion. You listen to some good music. And you drive away. And you say, wasn't that wonderful? And you don't think about Tacoma Park for seven more days. So when it comes to engaging with that community, we don't even understand the community. So we advertise, oh, we're going to have a nice concert. Sandy Patty's coming to town. She's going to sing at Sligo Church. We don't even know who to talk to to get that message out through the community. Anyway, I'm on my soapbox right now. But it is a big challenge. And so Tacoma Park said, you know, We'd like to see help settle some refugees. So a group of activists get together, and one of the councilmen says, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. We've got Avenus Community Service Center over here. Let's engage them because they know how to collect money. They know how to, you know, do distributions. They know how to handle in-kind donations. They have an accounting system. And they said, sure. And this is where networking comes in. It's so beautiful. Immediately, I thought of the new pastor who's Syrian origin in our church, Sligo Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I approach him. He says, ah, he says, you know, do you realize we have a Middle Eastern Adventist Association here in Washington? And there's a hundred of us when we get together. When I thought when I told the local people in Tacoma Park that they couldn't believe it. Because, again, those perceptions in their mind, if you're from Syria, you're Muslim. They had no idea that there was that many Christians, and the, that group is so excited to get involved in helping resettle some Syrians. But today we've come to worship our God. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah 
Go down to the potter's house. There I will give you a message. So I went down and saw him working at his potter's wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. There was this little piece of clay that lay on the banks of a large river. Day after day, it just lay there. And day after day, it wondered what would the future bring. He had thoughts of someday being something great. It would watch the trees come out with all their new leaves and be full of joy and think, someday I want to be great like one of those trees. And it heard the flowers sing in absolute joy with all their bright colors in the bright sunshine. And the little piece of clay thought and hoped that someday he would be more than just a little piece of clay laying there on the riverbank, watching boats go by, watching boys come to fish, watching people wash their clothes. One day as it was laying there, thinking about what might be, it felt a very sharp cut deep under it. This was a new, confusing, troubling feeling, and it felt itself being lifted up by a spade and dumped into a basket with a lot of other lumps of clay. Soon it was bumping down the path, but it couldn't see very well because of all the other lumps of clay. And finally the bumping stopped and the piece of clay found itself thrown into the corner with a lot of other lumps of clay. There it lay for a very long time, wondering what had happened. There it lay wondering what the future would be. There it lay wondering how it would ever be great in this dark corner. Many, many days later, it found itself and thrown into some water. And some hands began to push and squeeze and press and pull. And that little piece of clay felt it would never be the same after this treatment. It had no idea what was going on and felt terribly confused and even frightened of the future. Finally, the little piece of clay was pulled out, all slippery and all wet. And to its surprise, it was thrown onto a wheel that started to go around and around and around faster and faster till the little lump of clay couldn't even see what was happening. Head began to spin and those hands began to gently push and squeeze on that lump of clay, clay going round and round and round. The little clay started having thoughts about maybe now I will be something great and elegant. And after some time, the spinning stopped and when it got its head back together, it was lifted off and set on a little board. The little clay started thinking, I'm great now. I'm going to be something beautiful. I'm going to be something elegant. And there it had time to collect its thoughts and was sure it was going to be grand like the trees or sing like the flowers. And after a bit, it noticed a little puddle of water 
It was a bit dirty, but it was still clear enough that the little lump of clay could see his reflection. And there it saw what was a great, great shock. It was just a plain little straight-sided pot. No fancy shapes, no glazing, just a plain little old pot. What a disappointment. What a letdown. And for a time it sat there on that board feeling so sorry for itself. All the plans of greatness were now gone. It was going to be a plain little old clay pot. About that time, it was moved and stuffed into this strange place with lots of other similar pots. And soon it got warm and warmer. And after a while, it was hot. Then it was super hot. And the air was so dry, the little pot couldn't even breathe. And it was sure it was going to perish in this place. And all the little pot could think about was all is lost. I'm finished. This is the end. After a while, what seemed like forever, the door was opened, and he soon was stacked on a shelf in a corner. Now he could hardly see a thing. And he felt sad and very sorry. The thoughts of greatness started to fade. He was one sad little Sorry, discouraged pot. And then one day, things went from bad to worse. The sorry little pot had an indignity that was worse than anything he'd imagined, and he thought it was worse than he could take. A set of hands pulled him out and threw some dirt into him and dumped some water on him and set him back on a shelf in a dark place. It was enough to make him sputter and shake. After many, many days, it was brought out into the sunshine. And there it sat, day after day, wondering how life could be so cruel with water being thrown on it from time to time. For the longest time, that little pot sat there feeling so bad, so sad, so crushed. It was only a little straight pot, and now it was a dirty little straight, straight pot. It did, however, notice from time to time some stirring deep inside, kind of like a little tickle. Strange feelings. But there was no dirty little pond of water so that it could see what was happening. One day, the little pot was picked up and brought to a grand hall. And soon, a group of people came around and they looked looked and they pointed and they talked and he even noticed some real bright, bright flashes of light. The little pot was really confused. Why would people want to look at a plain little old pot? And what were those flashes all about? It was wondering what was happening. 
finally, it noticed another little pot a little way over. And it asked the little pot, what's going on? Why are these people looking at me? Why are they talking about me? And the little other little pot said, you don't know? You haven't heard? No one has told you? You have the most beautiful, beautiful, prize-winning flower coming right out in the middle of you. It is coming right up out of your heart. It doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter what. We all started out as something laying on the bank of a river. We all started out as a little lump of clay. And in our lives, we've all been pushed and we've all been squeezed. Some of us have been burned. And we've all wished this or we all wished that. Why don't I have the skill? Why is my ear so ugly? Why am I not as clever as Jane? We all have had a bit of dirt thrown on us and maybe some water splashed on us. And we've all wondered, why me? Why me, Lord? Why me? We have to remember and never, ever forget what God said. It is what is inside that I notice. It is what is inside that I care about. It is what comes out of us that makes us great. It is what comes out of our hearts that makes us something to be noticed. It is what comes from our heart that makes us someone to be admired. It is what is deep inside us that gives us the foundation for greatness. It is the stirrings that will surprise us with greatness. Now I trust that this week, when some dirt was thrown on you, you can think of this little pot. When you're taking a test and the question is so hard and you're sure you're going to miss it and you're going to fail, think about the little pot. When someone says something to you that hurts, when someone gives you that look, remember, God wants to be right there to shape you into a pot that will hold the most beautiful, prized flower. Look at what God made from that little lump of clay. And with each Sabbath, when we meet the other flowers that walk through the door, we'll grow a little bit more like a church that will be God's prize-winning church. That we will be the flower in this community that brings peace, 
that brings joy to this community. A flower that will draw all men towards me. God has a plan. And, you know, the scriptures, you know, that's what the scripture is all about, right? He wants us to be a light on a hill. He doesn't want us to be covered up. He wants us to be the salt of the earth. And, and if we never engage with the community, we'll never be the salt of the earth. I'm very pleased to hear that tomorrow this church is going to do something to engage with the community. The community is looking for us to do something in the community. I've often thought and talked you know, if we just come here every Sabbath morning and sing Kumbaya and we go home and we never do anything to let people know who we are and what we believe and what we think, we've played right into the devil's hands. Why would he give us a hard time? Because we're doing nothing. You know, you, he doesn't mind if we come together here and praise God and have a nice little time and then never engage with the community. We're no threat to him. But it's when we engage in the community. When we, because what is God's intent for everybody in the community? To destroy, not God, the devil's intent. To destroy humankind, isn't it? When we get engaged with the community to change that, to save someone out of that community, now we're in the devil's face. And he's not going to go lightly. It's going to make him mad, and he's going to give trouble. So we need to come together. And we need to be, as a group, the most beautiful flower for miles around. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you a message. So I went down and saw the potter working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Those are some real words to ponder in the week ahead. May we all be God's pot. And a pot that will have something beautiful and grand grow up out of it. God bless you on this Sabbath. This time we were going to we worship with tithes and offering. And uh, each week we have an encouragement for you. This week has to do with chaplaincy ministry. There is a ministry as it relates to chaplains. The Great Commission demands our authorities on a global concept. And chaplaincy is one of them. Whether on public universities uh, or in secular business institutions, military units, hospitals, or crisis points in the world, an advanced Adventist chaplain is likely making a difference in the midst of the crisis. Uh, chaplains represent the work of the church as surely as do pastors of a local congregation or an evangelist who plan churches where none have been before. The Adventist Chaplain Ministry, uh, abbreviation uh, ACM department, is the agency 
to support our chaplains. For 30 years, Adventist Chaplain Saving Ministry has touched lives meaningfully. Civilians, bureaucrats, police officers, hospital, patients, students, prisoners, disaster victims, and military personnel in all arms of the military, we can find them. Uh, our campuses, on campuses, they create a spiritual comfort zone for young believers and seekers. They represent our church as the hands, feet, ears, arms, and the heart of Christ. They seek, they serve where most church members can't go. Today, send them your support and appreciation through a generous offer. On your envelope, write Adventist Chaplain. Your generosity will be appreciated and will be will use and go directly to support that ministry. So Max and the deacons to come forward as we live this morning tithes and offering. Let us pray. Oh Lord. We know and we have seen and we have just read that this mission goes far and wide, includes all manner of activities that it goes to support those who are out there working for your cause. We ask for your blessing, O oh Lord, on the offering and the ties that go forth for those causes, especially to the chaplains that are ministering to others. We did say that we're, we have touched the least amongst them that we have ministered to you. So we ask for your blessing upon this support offering. We do so now, O Lord, in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. As you come forward with your offering and tithes, you can put it into the offering plate and then disperse to the side. Is blessing me right now, right now. The Lord is blessing me right now, right now. He woke me up this morning. And he started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. He's blessing me. Oh, yes, he's blessing me. He's blessing me. He's blessing me, 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 the Lord is blessing me. You're unable to come forward and would like somebody to pick up your tithes and offering please put up your hands and the deacons will do so anyone thank you please stand as we sing our closing hymn song number 341 to god be the glory great things he has done Great 
things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the floodway that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give him the glory. you're willing to push and pull on us, to shape us into being your children, to being beautiful examples of Christian love, of God's forgiveness, of God's ability to transform. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Welcome.